Maurice Mitchell, he is an activist now. He's the national director of the Working Families Party. He's done a lot of great work. Maurice, welcome to the show. Hey, Dean. So happy to be here with you. Thanks for making time, my friend. You know, I I really like what Working Families Party is about. And I don't think enough people know about what you guys do. And I know you're going to be even bigger impact on 2020. So let's go back and just give people a little bit about the origin story of Working Families Party. Sure. So around, you know, 21 years ago, folks um, were recognizing that, you know, the Democratic Party had kind of lost its relationship with working people, with labor unions, that organizations that represent work, uh, working people. And, you know, if, if you remember, you know, folks like uh, the Clintons developed the strategy of triangulation, basically trying to out Republican the Republicans and use that as a winning strategy to win elections everywhere. And, you know, folks felt like there was a need to have a electoral political vehicle that was for and by working people. And that's where working families really uh, came out of that, that desire. And, you know, we um, and, and actually there was other conversations in the past, this idea called the new party. Mm-hmm. And we were birthed out of this desire to have independent politics. And so the, the party really built its, its, its legs under it in New York. And then we expanded to uh, Connecticut and other states. And now we're all over the country. We have activists all over the country. And, um, you know, the party has dug it deep in, in more than a dozen states around the country. And you're you're not part of the Democratic Party, although you're a progressive movement. And that's my understanding, correct? And you have a lot of community mm-hmm. organizations and you endorse people. The Let me ask you, though, first, before we get into the politics, working families, sure. a lot of times it conjures up for people like, white middle-class working people. That's the only ones out there. And I had these conversations like with Zelina Maxwell, who's the head of our network and stuff like that. And, and, yeah. and how, and she's African-American. She goes, that's, that, what a horrible media narrative where they keep talking about the working Americans and they always show a picture. Yeah. And obviously there are white people who are middle-class who are working, but that's not what working class means anymore. What is it from you've seen from your work? Sure. I mean, you know, when we're talking about working families, first of all, we want to complicate how people even understand work. Right. Mm. So anybody who wakes up every day and has to hustle, has to work, has to put, put their legs into making sure that they have a roof over their head, they have food, they're able to pay the bills. You're a working person, whether or not you're empo- some, some some working people are employed. Some people are unemployed. Some people are employed in the traditional economy. Mm-hmm. Some people are doing work in the in a non-traditional economy. But, you know, the vast majority of people all over the world are working people. Right. And we know that that's a very, very diverse set of people. In fact, um, you know, the, the working class and how we understand the working class is changing rapidly. You know, when you when you think of working class people, I think sometimes there's this picture of a, you know, white middle aged person working in, you know, um, you know, in the Rust Belt somewhere that sure. is a working person. Right. Sure. But we know that there's working people all over the country. Right. That uh, many of them are women, that many of them are women of color, uh, that, you know, there are working people who are both native born folks, they're working people who are, are immigrants. It's a very, very diverse group of people. So I'm talking about a multiracial sort of working class populist group of people that we think have been ignored by both political parties and the political establishment in general. And, you know, that's the vast majority of people in this country that need a political home, and we're trying to provide that. It's remarkable and so accurate when you say a lot of the working people in America have been ignored by the two major parties. And I, and I don't mean, you know, the local council people and stuff like that. At the top end, up until recently, like really recently, uh, there were the, t- the top Democrats and Republicans, the establishment ones, were very, very similar. They were, you know, Democrats were Republican lights a lot. Um, now we're seeing a stark contrast. So how was that playing out? Like in 2018, you endorsed a lot of candidates. What did you look for in the candidates that the Working Families Party endorsed? Sure. A few things. Number one, we want to make sure that our candidates are reflective of the people that they represent. Mm -hmm. Right. So that means we're looking for everyday working people who actually have to deal with the day to day challenges that most people have to deal with, like student loan debt or, um, you know, credit card debt or um, have to deal with the the challenges of being a working person and finding jobs, being underemployed, overemployed like actual lived experience in the real real world, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, number two, 
reflective around um, their demographics. So we want to see more women in public office. We want to see more people of color in public office. And that really matters, right? We, we think that we have a better democracy when people who, um, who are of, of, of a variety of identities play these roles. And then the last, the last thing is reflective in terms of meeting the need um, with solutions that are to the scale of the crisis that everyday people are, are dealing with. So we want to we want to find candidates that are bold enough to present bold ideas that actually deal with the concerns that, that working people have, not just marginal reforms around the edges mm-hmm. uh, that are poll tested. You have to check in with the folks in Wall Street to make sure that these these reforms don't in any way cut into their in, into their uh, uh, margin too much. Right. We want to make sure that th- these. Uh, we center instead of Wall Street folks and other people, we center everyday folks. So when we get that combination, and the last thing is that they're willing to run their campaign in a people-centered way where they're relying on small dollar uh, dollar donations, and they're also relying on the volunteer contributions of everyday people. That combination, we've seen it's a winning combination in every region of the country, in um, you know, really, really do, uh, deep blue states and, and quote unquote purple states and, and red states, uh, we, we we think that that when you put that together, mm-hmm. everyday people, regardless of you know, I think there's too much of a focus on sort of the the left right sort of binary fight that you see on, yeah. on cable news and sort of like the republic. Like to us, the significant cut is the tens of millions and hundreds of millions of everyday people. And, you know, who are just trying to struggle to make it um, the literally 3000 people around the world that live like gods or billionaires. And then the, you know, the, the handful of, of multimillionaires and corporations that have taken have, have captured our democracy and we want to reclaim it. And we think that that's a, a conversation that most people understand. Uh, most independents get that most everyday people get that. And the majority of people actually aren't fixated by sort of the dogfight. They just want solutions for their families. And so we think as long as we focus on those things, um, that's a that's a winning formula. And I'm chatting with Maurice Mitchell, the national director of the Working Families Party. So but just for the nuts and bolts of it, so people understand, Working Families Party, you have your own, you, the people run in your party. They actually get the nomination from your party. And they'll have a, in New York, if I recall correctly, you actually have a, a line that they'll be the Working Family Party's candidate. Is that correct? That's that's correct. So um, I, I don't want to get into the weeds on on election law. So I'll break it down in this very simple way. Sure. In New York and a few other states, there's something called fusion. Mm-hmm. And all that means is that um, it, one candidate could get endorsements from multiple parties. Right. Exactly. Right? And so we we have a line in New York uh, where, you know, Oregon is also a fusion state. South Carolina is another place that we're in Connecticut. So in those states, um, you know, we can endorse uh, a candidate and they could also be endorsed by the Democrats. And so what that does is it, it gets us over the quote unquote spoiler, spoiler dilemma, right? Mm-hmm. Where people could vote their values, vote on the working families line. And if we feel like somebody who also is a Democrat is, has our values, we can endorse them. And then we don't necessarily have to deal with the spoiler dilemma. In other states, um, one, of, one of the ways that we kind of like sort of hack the system, right? is that ultimately when you think about what a party is, a party is simply people coming together to do electoral work, to advance an agenda that's distinct, uh, that's based on their vision of the world that they want. And so in that way, we're building the party all over the country, and we often use the Democratic primary as the terrain of struggle. Mm -hmm. And we we primary corporate Democrats and other people that aren't, in line with the with the values or delivering for their constituents with people who are deeply connected and accountable to working people. That's interesting because I know them from New York. So the fusion idea is here where you'll have a candidate who's a Democrat and has a Working Families Party line at the same time. So let me ask you about a few key issues that are, that are on the website and how the Working Families Party wants to see candidates address them going to 2020. One of the big ones for me is income inequality. What do you want to see done there? Right, right. This is this is uh, really the crux of of what of the crisis that so many working people are facing. Right, mm-hmm. and we want we want candidates and we want others to talk about income inequality in a way that um, addresses people's lived experience. Right, and we want to 
not just talk about it from uh, the standpoint of class, but class and race, because income inequality affects, and, and class, race, and gender, income inequality affects um, uh, women very differently than, and, and it affects people of color very differently. And so we want to have a broad sort of intersectional conversation. And the way, it, there's a number of ways that we, we think we could address it. Uh, you know, one big structural way that we could address income inequality is by um, getting money out of out of politics, mm -hmm. right? Getting getting corporate money out of politics, so that over time um, we have enough working people have enough power in order to to effectively tax corporations, uh, tax the wealthy, um, and you know we believe that um, folks who have been afforded a lot in this economy should be taxed in, in, in a way commiserate with their um, with with everything that they've been afforded in the, in the economy. So sure. creating a sane tax stru structure. We also want to break up the big banks. You know, the financialization of our economy is one of the reasons why uh, the winners have mainly been people uh, people who aren't wage workers, but the winners have been people who have played in Wall Street. And so we want to break up the big banks, um, make sure that wage earners are, are getting um, – are, are getting more of the pie um, and also that wage earners, working people are accessing our democracy. So there's a relationship between um, the amount of political power that everyday people have and how the, the democracy functions. And the fact that corporations and the wealthy have captured our democracy is one of the reasons why over decades we're in this position. So we think that, you know, we didn't get in this position overnight. No. We got into this position because a group of people organize our politics and our economy in a way that only benefits them. And the only way we could stem that is by, by having a, a conversation around the structures that need to change. And part of that is reclaiming our democracy. I think it's interesting when you talk about the idea of closing income inequality, as a concept, it might only apply, may, it might only appeal to progressives. But when you talk about the details, like raising taxes on the ultra wealthy, you see 70 plus percent of Americans support, including a solid majority of Republicans. Same thing, taking big money out of politics. And you'll see a solid majority on both sides saying that's the right thing to do. And yet we cannot get people in Congress, despite this strong majority for both those things, to do it. And it's remarkable because it makes it makes us aware that. Our vote doesn't match the million dollars someone give legally to a super PAC. That's the, the world we live in. It just doesn't, can't do it. You, if you're a politician and my vote means the same as someone who gave you a million dollars, you're a moron. So you should care more about the guy who gave you a million dollars. And that's the problem. That shouldn't even be legal. Yet it is legal in our system. That's right. We have to, so, you know, what, it, it's funny. In the last, you know, in the last presidential election, there were two candidates that basically said the same thing. If you remember, and, and from do, two different angles, both Bernie and Trump said the system is rigged, mm -hmm. right? I remember. And, I recall that. Yes. And, and they couldn't be more right. The system is actually, you know, the thing is that Trump, Trump said it, and then, you know, he went in a, <laughs> he went in the direction that he went, right? Right. But, you know, the underlying critique is, is valid. The actual structures of our system is rigged in favor of the pe people who are already privileged and powerful, right? And the, the, the number one priority on our agenda has to be to unrig the system um, and to create fairness where fairness really ha hasn't ever existed in our in our democracy, right? And it, it's gotten to a place where you know, with the rendering of of uh, money into speech and endowing the properties of and the rights of individuals to, to corporations. You know, we've set up this, these conditions where um, corporate actors, corporations, and billionaires basically could write checks in order to bend, bend the the will of government towards their niche agenda. And they have a, you know, and it's interesting, like the way that we talk about it is mm -hmm. like, you know, I think, like just like you said, the, the vast majority of people agree with these issues, right? Yep. When we frame it, and so we should frame it in the most popular populist sort of uh, rhetoric possible. This is just like common sense things that most people agree with, right? Yep. You know, when we frame it in the sort of uh, hyper-partisan way, I think then you see things kind of drop off. But like, you know, our agenda, the, the, the progressive agenda is a popular agenda. This is what most people actually are concerned with. Most people, most everyday people aren't thinking about um, uh, the corporate tax rate and how how corporations are are are, are somehow in, in this economy 
struggling and the work that we need to do is, is to bring the corporate tax rate to 21 percent like this is no. such a niche agenda of of an elite agenda that it, that the republican party uh, principally is is has been advancing for, for years. Mm-hmm. The way I feel like we need to talk about, about this is like, listen, you have a minority that is a, both a class and racial minority of very, very wealthy white men who have almost completely captured our economy mm-hmm. and captured the, the Republican Party and are involved in capturing the Democratic Party. And then you have all of us, all of us of every race, color, gender background, regular people. Mm-hmm. And in in the face of that, understanding that they've taken, uh, attempted to take uh, our power, what are we going to do? What are we going to do when, uh, when, when they have taken control over the most intimate decisions of our lives that have to deal with how well our, our kids get educated and, you know, how much money can we take home and, you know, whether or not we could love who we want to love. These intimate decisions, do we feel comfortable allowing this niche group of people to have control over those decisions? And if not, what are we willing to do in order to, to unrig the democracy so that we could, again, take control over those very, very intimate decisions in our lives, right? That's yeah. what we're talking about, you know? Um, and when we break it down like that, most people, people identify as independent, people who even identify as Republicans, most people get that. Like, yes, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Something should change. We should have control over our lives, not the ultra wealthy and corporations. And let me touch on another issue here. I'm chatting with Maurice Mitchell, the National Director of the Working Families Party. Another big issue on your website. There are various ones from Medicare, for all, and others. Sure. What is for criminal justice reform, from your point of view, the Working Families Party, what do you want to see the 2020 candidates address, and how do you want it to be addressed? Sure, sure. So, I mean, we actually were, were um, I was just in a conversation around this. I mean, there's so many places that we we could reform the the criminal justice system. So, number one, we should abolish cash bail. Nobody just based on the fact that they're poor should have to language in a jail cell. Um, it's just, it's, it's morally repugnant. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we should, we should repeal the, the nineties crime bill, you know, that, um, you know, the, the Clintons and others and many Democrats supported, right. Um, that has led to hyper, um, sort of the hyper incarceration and mass incarceration of a generation specifically of young black people, but a generation of people all across America in general. And um, to, to a really sort of um, destabilizing impact to so many communities. Um, you know, number three, we need, to, we need to put more resources into alternatives to incarceration and community-based solutions to harm and violence. We've actually seen that those alternatives are more efficient and more effective Mm -hmm. and because we know that jail and prison the recidivism rate the rate that people return into the system is so high that that any other system that had that that rate of failure we would be trying to figure out how to totally think it how to totally and instead you know we have this quote unquote tough on crime sort of mentality where it's all about spending as much money as possible in prisons jails and police even though the data says these things don't work, right? And so, you know, I, again, it's about common sense. We want solutions. Everybody wants to be safe. Nope. Everybody wants real solutions to harm. Mm-hmm. The current, the current sort of jail and incarceration and prison industrial complex is an industry that doesn't deliver on on making our community safer. And so, you know, there's those reforms that I talked about and there's several more mm-hmm. that will create a, a sane and more safe, safe solution to the, to the real issues around public safety that all of us have. And, and so we're really, and, and the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, this, the, this intersects with race and class is that, you know, we live in a, we live in a society where if you're a wealthy person, mm-hmm. you live, you play by different rules. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, effectively, in any real way, marijuana currently is is legal if you're wealthy, and it certainly is is legal um, for most white people who live in white communities. And it's illegal if you um, if you live in a state where marijuana isn't decriminalized, and you live in a in a poor community or certainly a poor community of color, right? And so the criminal justice system is one of the clearest places where we see all of the sort of race, class, and sometimes gender inequalities that many people on the right won't even have a conversation about because they they will you know uh, 
like argue like again and again that these things don't exist and we think the criminal justice system is is uh, a place that requires it's like this is a human rights concern yeah. right this is not again a partisan concern it's a human rights concern nobody should be satisfied to live in a country where based on the zip code you live in on your racial background or anything else that you should have significant and disparate outcomes and so we want to figure out a way of closing those uh closing those disparate outcomes and just not looking for a way to police our way out of every problem like these the underlying all of these all of these issues are are the issues of income inequality are the issue are these structural issues around our, our economy like many people who end up in in jail and prison around uh around drugs you know it, these are economic concerns that is an mm-hmm. industry people People are, are smelling, uh, are selling uh, uh, small quantities of, of drugs in order to, to make ends meet. And so gutting out of our economy, you have, you have uh, a generation of people who are making ends meet in the, in, in the informal economy. Mm-hmm. And then you're criminalizing that informal uh, behavior instead of dealing with the underlying economic issues. And, you know, we just want sanity and common sense. And we, we want to create an environment where our government is working for us and not locking us up. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think the beauty of 2020 with all the varied candidates out there and a lot of the energy on the more progressive wing, that this is the time to push for so many of these issues. And, yeah. you know, you guys, if people want to find out more, Maurice, before I let you go about the Working Families Party, to see in their state, wherever they live, find out more, where should they go to? Great. So I'm glad you asked. Well, they could go on the web mm-hmm. and they could go to workingfamilies.org. So that's one way. Um, the other thing they could do is they could text WFT to the number 738674. Again, they could text WFT to the number 738674, and then we'll say 738674. Is that right? 738674. All right, I'll see if anybody, I think more people will probably sign up online, but maybe they'll text. That'll be great. 738674, text WFP. Maurice, it was great meeting you, my friend. Keep up the great work. Working Families Party is moving. I mean, I see them in New York. It's, I saw so many ads for the, the race for for a uh, public advocate and you guys are doing a great job That's there. Right. So keep up the great work. I look forward to chatting with you again in the future. Great. Thanks for having me, Dean. Anytime you want me to come by, I'll be happy to. Great. Thanks Maurice. Take care.